Hello. Welcome to the Berkeley Haas Speaker Series, New Thinking in a Pandemic, Business, Economics, and Inclusion. I'm Laura Tyson. I'm a distinguished professor of the Graduate School at UC Berkeley. I'm a former dean of the Haas School and a longtime faculty member of the Haas School. Uh, I co-chair Governor Newsom's Council of Economic Advisors, but I'm speaking here today as a faculty member, uh, not as an advisor to the state. Today, I'm joined by one of Haas School's outstanding professors, Ross Levine. He's the Willis H. Booth Chair in Banking and Finance. He's an expert in among financial economists, how finance shapes our economy, finance as a foundation of economic prosperity. He is one of the world's most influential financial economists. Uh, we uh, scholars look at Google citations as a measure of impact. And uh, Professor Levine is listed as in the top 12 of academic economists on Google citations. So congratulations, Ross. Your, your academic work is highly influential. He also does uh, work advising central banks, advising regulatory agencies, advising regulatory multilateral organizations. He worked at the uh, World Bank. He worked at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve. He's written two widely cited books on, bank, on the banking system and regulation. I invited Ross to participate in this series when I heard about his research on corporate social responsibility. I, when I was dean many years ago at the end of the 1990s and early 2000s, the word corporate social responsibility, those words didn't exist yet. Uh, we tended to talk about it then is, are there investment or financial decisions motivated by what was then called a triple bottom line? Financial return, environmental return, and societal returns. Uh, at that time, back in the late 1990s and early 2000s, Haas School, I just want to emphasize, became a real uh, at the frontier mover in this space. We started a Center for Corporate Responsibility. We started a student-run fund on corporate social responsible investments, uh, which exists to this day, and as a training uh, ground for students to learn about investing in corporate social responsibility and then go on to careers there. We today have a initiative called the Sustainable and Impact Finance Initiative. The words in this space have changed. They've become corporate social responsibility to sustainable investment, to impact investing, all of those things. And the SAFE initiative uh, covers all of those things with courses and activities. I'm very proud of Haas in this area, and I just want to start with that. Uh, during this period of time, during the last decade or so, a growing number of finance economists, including Professor Levine, have become more and more interested in this space and then trying to answer some fundamental questions that economists have. Is there a trade-off between, the, remember that triple bottom line? Is there a trade-off between a financial return and an environmental return and a social return? Uh, if you try to invest in the environment? Does that actually improve your financial rate of return? So the trade-off question has been a huge issue. Um, and that's one of the issues that uh, Professor Levine has motivated his work. Uh, another issue is uh, how is corporate social responsibility uh, reflected in COVID responses, another area that Professor Levine has dealt with. And then finally, competition policy. The more competition in a marketplace, does that make a company more or less sensitive to uh, investing in ways or doing things that are considered to be corporate social responsibility? So a very exciting space, a huge amount of research going on. And I am so happy, I just want to say personally, to see scholars of the uh, influence and of the capabilities of Professor Levine getting involved in this space. I am very pleased that that has happened over the years that I have been thinking about the space and involved in it. So I want to start with a question to Professor Levine. How did you get here? How did you get interested in this space? So you were uh, doing regulation, you were doing advising things like the World Bank. What brought you to this space? Well, actually, your introduction, your motivation of the topic, it's like, how could somebody not be interested in examining the role of corporate social responsibility? Um, I think to answer your question, 
like many, like many researchers, I was a bit skeptical, and that's what led me to dig in a bit deeper. So as you pointed out, my, my research mostly focused on finance, financial regulation. And mm -hmm. the thing I kept finding was that as you made markets more competitive, more contestable, that that's when you would see financial institutions reduce the amount of credit that they gave to cronies and that they gave to the politically connected mm -hmm. and that competition would spur them to give more credit. And I would view credit as part of economic opportunities. They would give more credit and economic opportunities um, to those with the best ideas, the most entrepreneurial energies, regardless of their connections or their income or their gender or their, or their race. So, mm -hmm. so not everywhere and always, but, Oftentimes, and, and usually, this issue of competition was associated with breaking down little fiefdoms and opening up opportunities. And so, when I was first started reading about corporate social responsibility, and it was sort of couched in terms of business leaders acting sort of on their good intentions and on ethics and on morality, not that I don't think that business leaders have all of those, I was a bit skeptical about that being a driving force behind big investments um, in strengthening connections with workers and with customers and with suppliers and with communities. And so mm -hmm. I, I wanted to look a little bit more, more closely for myself, given how much great work was going on in that area. So that, that's, what, that's what drove me to look at. Well, into. what's wonderful about it is, as I said, I think in terms of uh, professors of finance, finance, uh, departments, economists do, who do finance, that for a while there was a huge amount of thinking about this out there, but not really, the, the financial economists were not deeply involved in this. So I, I really applaud the notion that we're now bringing uh, rigor and data, we have more data of course now than we had before, rigor and data to answer some of the questions, like does it matter, does it change a firm's behavior in a way which is profitable. So uh, I'm de uh, delighted to uh, that you've uh, joined the, the field. Now, you have two studies that you have recently uh, been working on and publishing, and I think it would be great to summarize the results for the audience here. And, um, and so why don't I turn the, the, the screen over to you and your slides, Ross? Very good, let me, let me do this. There we go. There you go. Mm -hmm. So I decided to start out with this title to sort of pull the two <laughs> papers together is corporate social responsibility profitable. Mm -hmm. um, and corporate social responsibility, I, I think can mean different things to different people, but I'm gonna simply define it the way it's measured in the, in, 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 in the empirical studies. And so corporate social responsibility as it's measured refers to when, when firms engage in activities designed to enhance occupational safety, perhaps give greater flexibility of, of work hours, work training, provide opportunities for, for career development. Um, it also involves doing things like improving product safety, treating customers well. Um, some, sometimes the, the words that are used have to do with treating customers in an ethical way, but when the measures are, are put together, it's sort of responding to customer complaints in, 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 in a timely manner. And those are the measures on, on which this is um, developed. It could also involve increasing the fulfillment of informal obligations to suppliers. So do firms um, make when they when they say they're going to buy things from suppliers, do, do they follow through even if it's not part of a of a formal uh, formal contract? And then, of course, a big part of corporate social responsibility has to do with the environment: investing in reducing emissions, investing in using resources in a sustainable way. For some firms, it's also investing in innovations uh, in in environmental protection. So that broad collection of things is what um, I'm gonna use as a measure. And I think what the literature is using. And um, let me just, in, just to, uh, uh, interrupt here to observe that over the years, as there's become increasing interest in these areas, there are more and more efforts, good efforts to measure these things. So we have mm -hmm. firms are measuring more and they're disclosing more 
uh, because of investor pressure or regulatory pressure. But actually, we now have uh, measures that you can use in a study like yours to basically compare firms in different countries on their activities. Yeah, I was I was surprised. You'll, you'll, you'll see when I talk about the work that we've done but th there's now pretty detailed data over the last few years on, on almost 7,000 firms in terms of their um, activities with respect to corporate social responsibility. So like, like you say, that's, it's really extraordinary and it, it amounts to a large proportion of the world capitalization. So these are large firms all the way down mm -hmm. throughout. Fantastic. Um, so there are, there are differing views and, and I'm going to be, just because I only know how to make two columns on, on the PowerPoint slide, there, I'm going to divide these into two broad views. But one view might is a, is a fairly negative view of corporate social responsibility. And that simply argues that it's, it's essentially unprofitable. And, mm -hmm. But there might still be corporate socially responsible actions. Um, simply because executives use corporate social responsibility to obtain social stature. So executives uh -huh. want to go to cocktail parties and they <laughs> want to be held in esteem in uh, the media. And so one way in which they might go about this is by fulfilling these types of uh, uh, commitments or stating that the firm is going to engage in these activities so that they can look good. Um, Often called greenwashing, right? Exactly. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're trying to basically, it's not just about the status of the leaders, but it's about the firm has painted a nice greenwash picture of all of its good behavior. <laughs> and so there, yeah. there, to, to build on what you're saying, there's, there, there are many signatories, for example, to the UN's yeah. effort to get P firms to agree to do corporate socially responsible actions. And there are many signatories, but not everybody follows through. So that sort of is also suggestive of, of what you're saying and perhaps this, this view. There's, there's an alternative view, which is, which is interesting because it focuses on profits, essentially says that mm -hmm. in the long run, this stuff is profitable. So Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, which is the biggest, um, uh, I think, financial investment firm in the world, says, look, you, you, you can't be profitable in the long run unless you form these strong bonds with your workers, with your customers, with your suppliers, and with the communities in which you operate. And from this perspective, there might be too little of this activity if executives and owners focus on short-run profits. The point being that this, these type of CSR activities are costly, and they pay mm -hmm. off in the long run from building these relationships. And so you could get too little if firms don't want to incur those costs because they want the profits now, even though this means reducing the long run value of the firm. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Larry Fink has also, as you know, basically stated that he really wants the firms he's going to look at for investments now in the future, he wants them to disclose this information. In fact, he's even suggested that they use these uh, SASB standards, a sort of set of standards that's being developed uh, by a group of lawyers and accountants and economists. And he's saying, you, I'm going to look at firms and I'm going to look at these standards and I'm going to insist that you report. It's a very interesting thing going on here to get more information about CSR activity in a standardized form to investors. That's, that's what he's interested in doing. So. It'll be interesting, this is not something I've worked on, but it'll be interesting to see how that evolves because yes. sometimes when you have a pre-designed set of metrics, mm -hmm. firms feel like they have to fit their activities yes. to do that kind of a check checkbox. Mm -hmm. the, the overall intention of having those metrics is to have the firms do things to actually strengthen their yes. relationships yes. with those individuals. And there may be something firm specific about the best way to go about that. So sure. hopefully sure. those are flexible enough to allow firms mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. actually do what those, the, what, that, what those policies are meant to induce right. the firms to do. And, and by the way, that's what a lot of our students who are uh, running the, the uh, 
socially responsible investment fund. They're looking at those metrics. They're also looking mm -hmm. at firms individually because you actually do have to look at the firm specific things as well as the, the broader measures. Um, so, uh, cool. so go on, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I, I think it's interesting that there's just gonna be more and more information disclosed for you to do research on Ross. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so, I just wanted to make sure that, that that people are kind of there about how this stuff can be useful. And so this actually stems from uh, work on the operation of firms going back to at least coast in the beginning of the 20th century. And that is that firms really rely on implicit and informal agreements with all of the non-shareholder stakeholders that you can't write a formal contract about everything with everyone in a firm and induce everybody and compel everyone and have lawsuits going on if they don't behave in exactly the right way. That all of us, wherever we work, um, a lot of what makes in, in a work environment operate efficiently and enjoyably is when people sort of buy into the culture. And that, that word culture means so yeah. sort of agreeing to operate in, 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 in a manner, help each other out and, 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 and things like that. And so those informal in, in, implicit agreements are incredibly valuable in a firm. Um, and, and, and one potential strategy, not the only strategy, but one potential strategy for building shareholder, stakeholder trust, building the trust that workers have with the firm and building trust that suppliers and, and, and the community has with the firm is if the firm does certain things to signal that it's reputable and trustworthy and, and a reliable partner in this enduring relationship. And so CSR activities might be one such set of activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where this other point came in that we were talking about is that the upfront costs of establishing those long-term relationships and that trustworthiness, um, it pays off in the long run. And so this then relates to the governance of the firm. If the firm is focused on the short run, it may have too little CSR. Whereas if something compels the firm to focus more efficiently on the long run, you may actually get an, an increase in CSR type activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So from this perspective, it be, CSR becomes um, a, an additional strategy for maximizing profits. Right, it, it feeds into the profits, no, no trade-off. This is a way that it, it becomes a profit enhancing activity. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you'll, you'll see what, um, which is not to suggest that, it, it's not to make a normative statement that mm -hmm. executives should not engage in CSR Mm -hmm. above some profit maximizing statement. It's not making that type of normative statement, um, nor is it making a statement about that, that, that firms might choose different levels. It's just sort of, it can be viewed also as a profit maximizing strategy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So two papers, two questions. So the first, we started on the paper on competition and, 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 and about, and I'll get to that. And then what happened is the pandemic hit. And so we were sort of set up to examine something very specific about corporate social responsibility. And so we asked the question, going into 2020, if we looked at firms with different levels of corporate mm -hmm. socially responsible activities, we then mm -hmm. ask, how did they respond to the pandemic? Or actually more specifically, we ask, how did the stock market differentially price the value of firms with higher or lower levels of corporate social responsibility? Mm -hmm. And in, in this way, we could test one particular prediction about CSR. And that is, is that if CSR is used to establish trust and loyalty Mm -hmm. among workers and customers and, and suppliers and, and communities, then when something threatens the firm, the crisis and threatens communities as well, all of the different stakeholders should be willing to adapt and adjust 
in order to keep the enterprise going more effectively than if that trust and loyalty had not already been built up through CSR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's, mm -hmm. that, in this way, we can test a key prediction about what CSR actually gives to a firm. Does it actually that, do this? And, and that's where I want to say someone with your rigor can, when, when one poses that question, obviously there are so many factors that affect stock market valuation. So how you figure this out, how, how you try to measure that CSR effect as opposed to everything else that's going on in COVID and change in financial markets, uh, that's a, a, a key question. You don't have to answer it here, but I think it's what makes this research so valuable is that you've actually uh, tried to, in a very careful way to pull out the CSR effect. So part of what, yes, and, and the referees made us do that too. Um, <laughs> well, that's... <laughs> mm -hmm. So the, the, here's where we were talking about the, the data. So we, we, we had mm -hmm. already had this available. So, so we used data for across 61 countries and almost 7,000 firms, 90% of world stock markets. Wow. Okay. But we had already collected also lots of inf other information about the firms. So okay. we knew, for example, the financial conditions of the firms heading into 2020. We also knew whether okay. those firms had lines of credit with banks. So we okay. can control for, okay, the mm -hmm. crisis hits, did they have the financial cushion? Right. So we can sort right. of control for things like that. Then it was like, okay, there, there are other things. What about international supply chains? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Might be either getting their stuff from a country and, or selling their stuff to a country and their ability to get the supplies that they need and sell their goods depends mm -hmm. upon what's going on COVID wise in those countries. And mm -hmm. so we had had that information already. So these were also things that we could control for in order to isolate just CSR. Then there are other things it's like, okay, maybe the degree to which you invest in CSR type activities and establish that loyalty and that, and that trustworthiness, maybe it depends upon um, whether you have an institutional investor like BlackRock as yes. the block holder <laughs> or whether, right. whether you don't, whether you're a family owned firm, mm -hmm. think like yes. a hedge fund. So again, because we had been developing work for a different paper, we had mm -hmm. that information. So, so this was, the, these were the ways in which we could try to isolate on, on CSR. Mm -hmm. And then I'll mention one further thing, but I'll, I'll do that when I talk a little bit about the results in order to okay. try to hone in on CSR. Okay. Then the, the other thing we did was, and this was, this was the original paper that we had started to work on and then we <laughs> paused. Okay was to look at competition. Now, the reason to look for at competition is that if, if you remember, one of the reasons why a firm might not have the right amount of CSR, one theory is mm -hmm. that, oh, what happens if the executives or the owners are just focused on the short run mm -hmm. and they're not really maximizing the long run value of mm -hmm. uh, the shareholders? Yeah. Um, one of the things that competition does is it forces on um, pain of bankruptcy, it forces a firm to focus on long run shareholder value so that it can survive. Mm -hmm. And so if the firm didn't have the optimal amount of CSR and we hit this firm with more competition, then what we should see is an increase in CSR. So this would mean that, you know, if the executives were myopic and entrenched, and now we threaten their existence, then we should see a response in terms of greater CSR. And so we wanted to see in some sense whether competition, going back to some of the earlier, my earlier stuff on finance, whether this competition, what effect did that actually have on the choices mm -hmm. that firms would make? And so mm -hmm. that's, um, that, that was that paper. So. If it's okay, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the findings. Yes, please. 
Yes. So in, in the first one on, on corporate, we called it corporate immunity to the COVID pandemic, trying to be cute. Um, and, and what we found here was that firms with stronger CSR activities going into 2020 had much superior stock market performance when the crisis hit. So the crisis hits, stock markets um, go down. Um, later, there's, there's, there's some recovery, but when, when they went down, um, actually, there's, when that later, there's a lot of recovery. A lot of recovery, yeah. yeah. When they went down, um, what, what we saw was that the stock prices of firms with stronger corporate social responsibility sort of as a foundation going into 2020 went down much less than otherwise similar firms. So because we have so much data, we can look at firms within the same industry, within yes, the same that's important. country and say, okay, we have these two firms. You look pretty similar. You're the similar sizes. One of you's invested a lot in CSR. One of you hasn't. What happens to your stock prices? And so it's very consistent with this overarching view that CSR is part of establishing very, very valuable relationships with non-shareholder so you were able to so you were able to this is a, to repeat here that you have country data and sector data because obviously the, the the effect of this whole pandemic has differed a lot by sector yep. um some sectors being hard hit others not yep. uh so you were able to sort of make those distinctions exactly exactly right. that, that was sort of the yes Yes, you can't, right. you can't compare sort of manufacturing of computers and the hospitality industry. The hospitality and the airline <laughs> industry. <laughs> yes, there are certain ones, just can't. Okay, fantastic. So this is comparing two firms, same industry, and we can also know and can control for the degree to which they rely on international suppliers and, and customers and things like that. Great. The other thing, and this is this is what I wanted to, to mention, is that okay. is, is sort of because as, as a researcher, you, you're constantly trying to show whatever you're finding is is wrong in order to if it if, <laughs> then if you keep trying to show it's wrong and it's not wrong, you feel a little bit more comfortable with the mm -hmm. with the okay. results. So if this whole approach to CSR that I mentioned is right, whereby what mm -hmm. CSR does is it's a signal about the firm's trustworthiness so that, and that's how the firm goes about strengthening its relationship with, with workers and suppliers and communities and, and, and mm -hmm. customers, et cetera. Then the impact of a firm engaging in CSR, take two firms, they both engage in CSR. Mm -hmm. The right. effect is likely to be stronger if the firm is in a community, a country, where CSR activities are more valued by the culture at large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what we can do is go to surveys, those world value survey, and ask which types of countries oh, okay. value certain activities more than others. Mm -hmm. And then we can see whether CSR, the effect of CSR on stock prices is stronger right. in countries with social norms that really value the activities associated with those CSR activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that's, and, and indeed, that's what we find, which is additional evidence that, yes, the exact mechanisms through which CSR, according to this theory, helps firms survive you know, or become more resilient to the crisis. Resilient, it actually, yeah. It actually works exactly through those mechanisms. Okay. We thought that yeah. was pretty cool too. And it was that's pretty, amazing. It was, yeah, that I think that's a, a really interesting. I mean, I'm gonna the, 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 so the social norms were measured by the survey results. Uh, I think that's really it's it's a very important finding. I think I had I had not seen anything like it before. So. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we were, as, as I mentioned, when I came into sort of to, to as, as I sort of came into the CSR research as a, as an outsider, I was pretty skeptical. Yes. And I, as, as I tried to kill off this finding, and it didn't go away, and I kept and my co-authors and I kept thinking of different ways to try to kill it off. 
and it didn't <laughs> go away. I've, I've become, uh, yes, much, much, I've become much more of, a, of, of, a, of, a, of an advocate for this as a mechanism for firms to boost profits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the second paper talks about competition. And um, here we look at competition by looking at um, antitrust law. So here's how we go about measuring it. Um, so we look at things like the degree to which the laws limit the firm from engaging in anti-competitive agreements. So I'm sure you, like, like many people, have heard a lot about anti, well, you have heard, no, have heard about it for, for in all different dimensions, but right. most recently it's been in the news because of Google, right. so where the Justice Department is saying that Google engaged in activities that made it difficult for others to compete right. um, in that space. Well, there are laws, and, and these laws differ immensely across countries in terms of the degree to which there are restrictions on setting prices, dividing up markets, limiting supply, rigging bids, forming cartels, colluding, all of the different things that a firm might do in order to uh, cut out competition. And there are also laws about the exploitation of market power, whether this is discriminatory pricing for different groups or predatory pricing. So there are, there, there was recently a, a team of lawyers uh, based in and Columbia University put together very, very detailed data on competition laws um, across, oh, I see. Okay. Across, mm -hmm. across the world. And um, these are based, these are put together on an annual basis. These laws actually, the, this data set actually goes back to the 19th century, which we, we, can't, which we can't use in, in this paper because the measures no. of corporate social <laughs> responsibility don't go back that far. Yeah, all the other measures don't. I did, that's a, a yes, very important, right? Mm -hmm. So, so actually the team of people have to kind of go uh, at, at Berkeley now that you were mentioning, they have to go back and, and produce corporate social responsibility laws going back to the 19th century. But, mm -hmm. Okay. So what we find here is that the intensifying competition, meaning mm -hmm. changes in these laws that lower the barriers to other firms contesting a market tend to increase the degree to which firms then in, in increase their expenditures or investments in corporate social, corporate social responsibility actions. Um, and, 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 and this is very consistent with you intensify competition, you intensify the, the contestability of a market and firms respond by doing things that are going to make sure that are gonna increase the probability that they keep their best workers. They're going to yes. increase the probability that that, that customers are, are loyal, that they secure um, suppliers, and that their communities um, uh, kind of em embrace them and, and can kind of work with them to make sure that the firm can be as, as effective as possible. So the yeah. results are very consistent with an argument that when firms are more monopolistic, mm -hmm. um, they don't have to worry about these types of relationships as much, but when they're forced to when they're forced to deal with a more competitive environment, they have to embrace those relationships. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so then we kind of started to do a, link this a little bit more to some elements of uh, corporate finance because. Yeah. All right. Who owns them? <laughs> no, I was going to say, corporate finance is a little bit the other stakeholder in the room is the funder. So the hedge funds, the institutional investors like BlackRock, the individual investors. So yes. <laughs> exactly. And so yeah. we, what we, we did a couple of these. And so I chose one to put on this slide and we can, we can talk about some more. But we sort of said, okay, hedge funds in particular are, are known to oftentimes be highly levered. And they're also known um, to have shorter term horizons. And so in such an environment, intensifying competition on a firm where the hedge fund is an influential owner, in that type of an environment, there may be less of a response in terms of an increase in CSR activities, which are only going to pay off in the long run. There may be less of an, of an increase in CSR activities if you have a hedge fund that's a big 
owner, as opposed to if you have, if the, the firm is widely held or if you have an institutional investor like BlackRock. I'll also be interested, and probably I can find it in your paper and you don't want to take time now, but I'd be interested in like family owned firms. If that, that's an interesting one because I've just spent a fair amount of my life in the last year thinking about Germany. And a lot of those powerful firms in Germany, middle stock firms, are family owned firms. So, uh, and they say, oh, we have a very long term horizon. It's family, you know, generation to generation. But we can go on. But I think who owns the firm and what their time horizon is is very important, obviously. Mm -hmm. Exactly. On yeah. family owned firms, by the way, what we, we would sort of agree with the message that you're getting from your connections in Germany that family owned firms tend to already have mm -hmm. very strong relationships with their stakeholders. Yes, yes. So they've already invested a lot in CSR so that competition doesn't tend to affect them very much. Oh, I see. That makes so sense. That so they, don't, they don't have that problem where mm -hmm. the executives are, are myopic because it's a family-owned mm -hmm. firm that's focusing on the long run. Yeah. So you, you, what you said is, is is just right. Um, I didn't get that, but my co-author is kind of um, educating mm -hmm. that. So then there are other things. Look, if you're going to invest in CSR, you have to make an investment. So you should see a bigger effect in, in firms that can borrow in order to make those investments if that mm -hmm. theory is right. And this is um, what we find. And then we also go back to those, uh, to that same social norms social explanation norms. in the competition. Mm -hmm. So, so in some- So you have some- Powerful conclusions here. <laughs> so we thought so. It, 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 yes. It, it, so, um, so yeah, so the, the, the corporate immunity, um, it, it seems to, the, the data in terms of how stock markets treated firms with more or less corporate social responsibility, stock of corporate social responsibility activities um, is very consistent with CSR helping to form valuable mm -hmm. relationships okay. and comp the work on competition sort of suggests that yes competition gets pushes firms to become more efficient in terms of their corporate governance and that seems to force them to examine mm -hmm. focus on the long run and engage in more csr fantastic okay so then it, as a result here so Mil milton friedman Milton Friedman sort of, he's been much maligned in this corporate social responsibility because he, he has this, there's this quotation. So there's one and only one social responsibility of business to use its res resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits. Now that's where most people stop the quotation, but he did yeah. go on and sort of say, as long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to engage in open and free competition without deception or fraud. And there may be other reasons for CSR and I don't, we don't address them, but I, I don't think Fried, Friedman was not arguing against corporate social responsible, co corporate socially responsible actions, even if it's profitable. No, he was not. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was, I think that the whole issue was for a long time and what your research is showing and what other research is showing is there wasn't a trade-off that you, that right. actually the profitability was enhanced by the CSR to the extent that you didn't believe that, then you would sort of read what Friedman said and said, don't do it. Don't do exactly. any of the CSR, only pay attention to profits. But if your research shows the CSR is gonna enhance your profitability, enhance your performance, then it's completely consistent with Friedman, exactly. <laughs> as you <he> said, <laughs> right. I know that you also have been reading and thinking about Adam Smith in this <laughs> regard. So we're gonna run out of time soon if I don't get you to engage on. So Friedman made that much maligned statement 50 years ago. Adam Smith wrote several centuries ago. What have you been learning from Adam Smith lately that's related to this? So it, it, it's interesting because you have to think about two Adam Smiths. So there's okay. Adam Smith, the wealth of nations. And I think the Adam Smith, the wealth of nations would have been very much aligned with Milton Friedman, or probably Milton Friedman would have been very much aligned with the, the Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith. Right. And that is, you know, what Smith is saying in The Wealth of Nations is that if we live in a world in which people are motivated, if firms are motivated by profits, mm -hmm. um, then they're going to do things in order to maximize profits, and the CSR is one of them, so be it. 
And as long as competition's around, it's going to be fine. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> as long as competition's around, it's going to be fine. Yes, I'm sorry. You're yes. This has to be added um, because yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. in, in in the theory of moral sentiments, which it, 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 it's, it's, I probably read only because of COVID, and I had more time. He, Friedman <laughs> makes a. I mean, um, Smith makes a different approach. It's a different type of a book. It's it's it's, it's a philosophy book. Right. And there, what he is talking about really is what makes individual individuals satisfied and happy in life. Mm -hmm. And what he points out is, is that for him, the fundamental thing, and he, he says this in a much more beautiful way than I'll ever be able to, to, to express here, is that what people want is approval. Um, he really sounds mm -hmm. like a psychologist. He, what people want is approval. Okay. They want to be loved. They want to be respected. They want esteem. And he, he uses esteem. the word ap approbation. Okay. Um, and then he goes on to say that, look, one of the major ways in, in society that people receive approbation is by accumulating wealth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he also goes on to say that this is one of the things that is most detrimental, that that motivation is most detri detrimental to people's ultimate happiness is being motivated solely by that drive for the accumulation of wealth. So he would have been very torn about this. He would have, could, he would have seen that competition would push the firm and the, those managing firms in, 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 to, in, 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 in order to get profits, simply in order to survive, but he would have recognized as, a, as an individual that that's de he, not recognized. He would have emphasized it as an individual that will lead to a very empty life. <laughs> I think he might have thought also, or maybe if we had a conversation with him now, he could say that there are so, when you're seeking approval and you're seeking approval from your brand, from your public relations, from your relationship with large institutional investors like BlackRock, yeah. okay, yeah. that actually you're, it, it, it's not at all inconsistent with profits, okay? Yeah. It's basically profits in a responsible way. And what you're showing is in a responsible way, there's not a trade-off from these things that bring approbation as well yeah. as profits. So yeah. um, well, he, we, he would have liked he, he would have liked business leaders who were successful at running profitable firms to use some of those profits in other ways that might lead them to gain approval at a, for in a, in a, oh, in a broader and a broader. And of course, a, a lot of these community. firms. If you if you go back to your your set your data set, I think you'd probably find that a lot of these firms also have foundations or funds that they, they actually do have entities they've established either within the organization or outside to fund these kinds of activities as well. So um, yeah. we've passed our five minute That's warning fine. time. I wanted to see if you had one or two things you might want to say about. Is there any? policy relevance to this. I mean, one is certainly to make sure that we pay attention to competition policy, but you've yeah. been a policy advisor and probably will continue to be a policy advisor. Is there anything that comes out of this body of work that? Um... I, I, uh, I think what you said and, and what I emphasize is that this, this issue that a key role of public policy is to make sure that markets are contestable. Um, okay. That markets are not not markets are not perfect. They're not the answer to everything. That, mm -hmm. um, but but competition and contestability um, is oftentimes very effective at expanding um, economic opportunities for for people. So one one other area that might it's not directly in your work, but um, on the environment. Um, there's really, uh, I, in Europe more than here, but I think around the world, there will be more and more pressure on firms to, um, to price carbon, to measure emissions, so that there's another uh, policy can influence the CSR activity by particularly influencing the environmental area through regulation or, or through price or through price. Yeah. Yep. All right, so. Yeah, I was... 
you know, the disappointing thing with the environment is, is, it's, is the economics, I think, is reasonably clear. You want to tax, you want to tax sort of the yeah. uh, emissions beyond sort of the, you want to make sure people pay for what they're costing the rest yes, of the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And boy, we have not been very effective at simply <laughs> implementing those types of policies. Not, and it's not so far. So I, I will say on a, on a good news front that a little bit of good news, it's a good news front, it's early on. You may end up going back or uh, being involved with the central banks of the world are getting more and more focused on what are the financial market implications of say failure to price carbon and what that's going to do to the basset values and insurance costs over time. So we may actually get some movement because of that concern coming from the central banks. They're now doing scenario analysis on uh, sustainability. So, so maybe you'll be called back. I, I'm going to make sure they know about your research. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd be, I'd be, I'm a little, we'll have to wait for a, a different conversation. I'm a little worried about, uh, I'm a little worried about financial regulators who have had their own challenges in terms of keeping mm -hmm. financial systems uh, operating smoothly, Going. getting right. involved in environmental regulation. But well, it it, it uh, is it is beginning to happen. I think there's a very yeah. large number of central right. banks around the world. The Federal Reserve is not currently involved because of the current administration, but I think in another administration, the Federal Reserve would become part of that group. So I, anyway. I this is fascinating. I am so glad that you were able to share this, these important results. And I um, am delighted that you have decided to move at least part of your research capabilities and data capabilities into this area. I think it will become increasingly important. So thank you very much. Thank Ross. you, Laura, for inviting All me. Right. I really appreciate All it. Right. Take care and welcome. Uh, I hope that everyone, I know everyone enjoyed that conversation. It was really very, very insightful. Thank you for being part of the Haas community. Good day. Bye-bye, thanks.